Okay, and did you want me to share my screen to show the answers to the survey questions? The statistics on those? Uh, I mean, just a matter of how many people actually responded would probably be the more important answer. Um, okay, hello everyone. Are we, uh, are we recording? Have we begun yep. we're officially? All, all right, we are, we are officially beginning. So, um, hello everyone. If you have video, could you please enable it? Because talking to a pile of black squares is <laughs> uh, somewhat disconcerting for what is supposed to be a discussion class. Uh, so if you have video, please, 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 please enable it. Um, well, nobody. <laughs> One, yeah, two, all right, here we go. Going full Brady Bunch mode, love it. Um, also make sure you're not just sort of wandering off like that guy just did. Uh, uh, <laughs> sorry. Okay. So, uh, hi, I'm Kevin Harrington. Uh, you may know me from uh, uh, such uh, classics as uh, your BaseBot assembly video and uh, BaseBot assembly video parts two, three, and four. Um, uh, I also do uh, uh, a, uh, a fair bit of research on the topic of uh, ethics and philosophy, and uh, specifically with respect to robots. So I get uh, the uh, lovely opportunity to come in and talk to all of you uh, about this topic. So um, just uh, uh, do we have the participants' uh, little quick show of hands thing? Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Let me That's the managed participants. Screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. So participants, 35. Uh, can we get a uh, sort of everybody go into the participants tab and uh, uh, just click yes if you know how to click yes. So this will be a quick uh, test that everyone is present, listening to what I'm saying and aware of where the yes button is. All right. Got a couple holdouts. Why are there two copies of Dionis? Interesting. Um, Let's see here. Almost everyone. Can we get like everyone to click yes? Uh, all right. So of the people who don't have the yes clicked, I'm going to bet that you're just literally not here. Um, cool. I don't know who makes notes to that. Well, whatever. Make note of it. Okay. So uh, cool. Everyone's paying attention. Put your hands down. All right. Interactive. Almost interactive. I'm doing the best I can here. Oh, and we just got a no instead. Well, all right, that's fine too. <laughs> um, okay, so um, everybody put your hands up and I wanna see, see you're interacting. Now, put your hand down if, uh, if you uh, uh, watched the entirety of uh, both the videos. So hands up for, I didn't really get to it. Hmm. Hmm. Oh. Slightly better than our missing participants, but all right. Um, okay, so uh, did everyone at least watch uh, uh, the 15-minute uh, video and the first five minutes of the uh, uh, Isaiah Berlin video? Cool. Getting there. Oh. All right. This is somewhat reactive. We can deal with this. All right, living the dream. Uh, everyone loving their new Q-turn. Yeah, all right. Uh, so um, what I wanted to, to point out to you is uh, uh, the idea that philosophy is not something that is separate from what you do. It is basically everything that isn't imperial uh, or, uh, or empirical, rather. So uh, when you make a statement in engineering, you're making, uh, generally speaking, uh, what is called uh, uh, empirical statements, uh, true fact statements that are uh, corresponding to some portion of the physical world, the physical world being uh, uh, the measure against which we, we validate if something is true or not. If something's observ observably and repeatably true, it's true. Um, 
And then there are other kinds of rules or formal rules, the rules of chess. They are rules that we have created and they're internally consistent. Uh, the rules of the Star Wars universe, uh, the rules of math. These are internally consistent, uh, well, ish, in the case of Star Wars, but that's, that's a different funny topic. Uh, uh, the idea that rules are created uh, and then uh, we ask questions about those rules, those would be sort of formal. Outside of those categories is philosophical. Uh, uh, the questions of what should one do, what is uh, the right thing to do. And as as uh, uh, Isaiah Berlin points out, the primary way you know you're dealing with a philosophical topic is when you try to ask the question, what kind of question is this? You immediately run into trouble. Uh, so if I ask uh, 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 how far is the distance from here to here, uh, we might not know exactly what that distance is, but you know what kind of question it is and what form the answer is going to take. The distance from here to here is going to be a measurement in uh, millimeters and, and we can measure it with, with various measuring tools. Um, if you ask, uh, is the distance from here to here good? <laughs> that is a very different question because what kind of answer are we expecting to get? Uh, what does good mean? Uh, good is fundamentally a philosophical term. Uh, you know, uh, uh, philosophers have argued about it since the beginning of philosophy and, and nobody has come to a solid agreement. What is good? What is bad? Uh, what do these things mean? So I asked you to, uh, come up with some questions, uh, quite uncomfortable questions that you need to ask each other and uh, to challenge some assumptions. What assumptions do you come in the door with? Uh, and the one thing that I, I saw almost, <laughs> almost universally in the answers was uh, the question about jobs and challenging the assumptions would be challenging the assumption that uh, uh, various assumptions of uh, uh, eliminating jobs is a good idea. But what I didn't see is anyone challenge the assumption that jobs are a good idea. Did, did anyone think of that? Anyone at all? Hands. Who thought of that? Who at least thought of it? Okay, I'm turning the mic over to you. Uh, really, just uh, just an email here. Uh, B. Fracas, where are you? I want you to pop in and say something. Oh. Hey. What did you th mm. think? About jobs? Yes, about challenging the assumption that jobs are... Well, I mean, we currently we generally hold the idea that the way we run the world is you get educated, get a job and you make money until you die. And I don't think anybody really likes that. I don't, I mean, I'm sure you guys in, get fulfillment from education, but I think everybody would rather sleep in on occasion and spend time with their pets and children, right? That, that while, while there's fulfillment from productivity, uh, the nine to five job system and, and market is not necessarily good it it makes an interesting point um and yet everyone said something about jobs going away being a bad thing that was almost a universal assumption uh, uh in uh the responses which was fascinating to me that so many people could identify this problem but nobody could uh, uh sort of challenge their their own assumption that that is necessarily uh, uh, the problem, that, that getting rid of jobs is the problem, perhaps getting rid of jobs is the solution. And we should do it faster rather than slower so we stop having to like go do things we don't wanna do. Uh, and these are the sorts of challenges to assumptions that I'm talking about. Uh, just because you walk in the door with an assumed knowledge, there is this, uh, uh, problem with philosophical thought that uh, common sense is fine, that whatever you think is the right answer is 
fine. Uh, and the big problem that, that I, I think, especially engineering students uh, need to face is the fact that your assumptions about your own uh, uh, thoughts, your, the assumptions that you hold in your mind are rarely questioned. And that if you don't question them, you can be operating on bad data. Uh, the, the whole job of philosophy and the reason that it applies to everyone, everyone's life, not just the philosophers that create the questions, is that the questions a philosopher creates are questions that you need to answer for yourself and reconcile with your own assumptions. So what do we call the collection of assumptions in our own mind that we use to make decisions in our day-to-day -day life? There's, there's a term for this. Who's got it? Hands? Oh, almost. Uh, morals uh, is is a aspect of it. Uh, um, I'm, I'm looking for more what goes on inside your own head. Uh, the, the morals would be a set of rules that you use to construct this thing I'm thinking of. Schema. I think you're trying to say schema. Is that? Consciousness, yes, schema. So uh, schema is pretty close. Schema is interchangeable with uh, a more generally understood uh, term, which is ideology. So who thinks they operate on a day-to-day -day basis primarily through an ideological lens? Hands? Ah, so only a few of you understand this. <laughs> Uh, the truth of the matter is we are all operating through ideological lens all the time. And the more you have uh, uh, gathered together this idea that you're not behaving ideological, that is precisely the moment that you are behaving the most ideological. You are operating entirely on assumption. Uh, uh, the only way to sort of act in a way that is not ideologically driven, so not driven by your thoughts and assumptions, is you know, the state of meditation, where you're not engaging your uh, storytelling mind to form a, a coherent structure of the universe around you. That coherent structure that your mind forms, that's your ideology. That is how you uh, uh, will ultimately interpret data coming in. And that is the engine that decides what actions you will then take. The problem is, very few of us have looked internally at that ideological structure and checked to see if it's sound, checked to see if all the building blocks are made of rational pieces that make sense, even checked that different pieces of your ideological framework are incoherent with each other, that, that you don't have some sort of internal inconsistency. Very few of us have challenged uh, ourselves in this way. It's, it's very easy to challenge other people's see hypocrisy all the time. It is far more difficult to uh, uh, internalize that uh, uh, critique and look at your own assumptions. So this is why I wanted to drag up the idea of assumptions and force you uh, uh, in, in some ways to look at them. Um, so I've got two hands up. Are these hands uh, uh, looking to ask questions? Gionis? Or uh, start with Andrew. No, lowered hand. Gionis? <laughs> and lowered. Okay, good. Uh, moving on. <laughs> I'm paying attention. I'm listening. Uh, uh, so as we look at our assumptions, we need to do uh, a, a check and we need to make sure that what we're uh, establishing as the, the framework of what is good and bad is uh, coherent. So sort of the, the earliest stage of looking at your own self is for you to sort of uh, frame what is good and what is bad? And what do we mean by good and bad at all? These are not terms that are, are sort of instantaneously obvious. 
Uh, we use them a lot, but they don't necessarily have a very concrete definition. Uh, your good could be my bad and vice versa. Uh, which makes the judgment of your own actions and the judgment of the ideology that you use to guide your actions difficult until you establish for yourself what you mean by good and bad. So uh, let's discuss this a little bit. Um, I like asking this question because it, it sort of gets to uh, the root of what we're talking about here. Uh, what's a good robot? And not good as in functions correctly. I want to talk about the, the sort of philosophical good. Uh, a robot that is uh, in some way uh, good for uh, its existence. Its existence is good. And what do you mean by that? So who, who's got a, uh, uh, an example of, of a good robot? Hands. David, unmute, go. Maybe like a robot that picks up trash, for example. What does it do with the trash afterwards? It stores it or goes to recycle it somewhere. All right, maybe. I mean, depends on what, uh, it depends on where it goes. Uh, probably going to be hard to, to come up with a reason why that's not good, but, um, you know, the, the, has, has a bit, yes, the Wally, uh, uh, idea comes into mind of, well, is it picking up trash simply to make the world better? Or is it picking up trash because we've now decided to throw everything on the ground because the robot will pick it up? Does, does that produce good in the world? is is a hard thing to to pin down uh what i would say is it probably isn't doing any harm so cool uh madeline like search and rescue robots like after natural disasters or earthquakes oh i like that one a lot yeah search and rescue helping out in disasters uh, um you know where you need more hands and where those hands can be uh, uh harmed by providing aid that's that's a you know, search and rescue frontline workers in the coronavirus, decontaminator robots. I saw that recently. Um, yeah, cool. Uh, probably hard to come up with a reason why that's bad. Why is that bad? I don't know. Try that later. Uh, Obvi, I screw that. Yeah, you you said it correctly. Whoa! All right, go. Um. A robot that helps with curing diseases, like it helps diagnose people and it helps cure uncurable diseases. Diagnostics, great. Yeah. So using, I mean, uh, maybe a bit more software there than, than robot, but that's close enough to the same idea. Um, yeah, and and as, as with all of these robots, uh, um, you know, it raises the question, Cool. What happens to the person whose job that was? Um, in a sense. I mean, perhaps it goes away. Perhaps it doesn't. Now, let's let's talk about the uh, the flip side of this. What is a bad robot? Can you think of a bad robot? Hands. Bad robot. Who's got some bad robots? Julian. Oh, unknown like Skynet. Uh, let, let's go with uh, <laughs> reality as opposed to sci-fi. It's easy to come up with sci-fi uh, villains, but uh, uh, let, let's talk about reality for a moment. We've got a bad robot. Carly. Um, maybe like if there's such thing as like a robot assassin that like kills people. I mean. Not to be too awkward about it, but no ifs about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we, we call them drones, but, you know, whatever. Uh, yes. Um, I mean, real simply along that vein, a landmine or anything that behaves like it. Very simple sense act, uh, sense compute act loop. 
probably the simplest you could think of, but uh, uh, there you go. Uh, here's a question. So philosophically, what is the difference between a drone and a landmine? I mean, all right, so uh, let me put it this way. Why are landmines bad? Um, Maybe it's the fact that you're targeting it. It's like a landmine can just kill anyone random, no matter who steps on it. But maybe a drone is more targeted. It has a purpose, most more general. So do uh, I mean this is a little bit uh, military tactics here. Do we target people or do we target phones? I mean, in in reality, when we when the drone actually makes a target, is it like somehow have a metaphysical target of a human being or is it like literally targeting the radio waves coming off of a piece of uh, technology that's a phone anyone actually know it usually would be a phone but if it's yes a it would be a phone it's not a metaphysical uh, targeting system we haven't quite figured that one out yet so you know this idea that we're targeting people is a bit of wordplay more than it is reality. We, the, the robot's targeting another piece of technology and, and, and it's going to blow it up. You know, do, do we target collateral damage? No, no, they're just, they're just hit by that. <laughs> you know, are, do drone strikes kill only the person, the human being that we intended to target and no one else? Oh, you drop a bomb, you're dropping a bomb. You know, the, uh, the question is, where is the philosophical difference and, and who un ended up making uh, uh, the decision? Who, who is responsible for, you know, a landmine blowing someone up and drones just being fancy flying landmines uh, in this philosophical debate? But Landmines make it very clear cut and we don't have to talk, get too mired in the details of technology. So who's responsible for it? The person that laid it, the person that designed it. Uh, or maybe, you know, from an engineer's perspective, how many landmines would there be if all engineers refused to design landmines? <laughs> sort of a, uh, simple yet not so simple question. The question becomes, okay, if there wouldn't be any landmines because, because no engineer would design such a thing, then doesn't that then mean the engineers that chose to design it are responsible for it? I feel the, uh, the moral uh, uh, responsibility for landmines lies on whatever engineer sat down and designed the thing in the first place forever. They get to share that blame with the person that laid the mine. They get to share the blame with the, the person that purchased the mine in the first place. But ultimately, the engineer is the most responsible for all the death from all the landmines that were produced from their design. They're never going to not be morally culpable for that. And moral culpability comes from the knowing consequences of your actions. So back to the question of good or bad, if you know the consequences or you could know the consequences and choose to ignore them, you know, let's say you work at a military contractor and choose not to know what uh, the component that you're working on is going to ultimately be used for. That's not in any way going to absolve you from responsibility. You're responsible because you could have known. And once you find out, you're ultimately responsible for whatever happened from your actions. And this is the sort of sucky part of morality that <laughs> you don't get to argue with. Just because you don't think you should be responsible for something does not then make you not responsible for that thing. If you knew it could have happened. 
this is, you know, a legal distinction, but bo basically boils down to the continuity of consciousness. As long as you are the same person that you were when that happened and can remember being that person, you're still that person and you are morally accountable for the actions that you took at that time. So when you make a robot that has a knowable consequence, and we, we were all very concerned with jobs, and we'll get back to that in a second. Um, but any sort of harm that you know that you can cause, you're never going to not be responsible for that. So I use a, uh, um, a particular thought experiment for this. And, and bear with me for a second. If you think this is going to sound religious, it, it's not. Uh, and you'll see why in a second. Because what I'm going to say is true. And you need to understand what I'm saying is an empirical truth and not a... Uh, uh, just some, some idle rambling. You are being observed. Every action you take now into the future, technology present or not, you are being observed. Your actions and the decisions, the reasons that you use for the decisions that you make is also being observed. Why you chose to do something, what you knew at the time, what you could have known, what you chose not to do, these are all things that are being observed. And at some point far in the future, you will have the, the observer judge you for your actions. Your actions are observed and that at some point in the future, the observer, the one that is doing the observing will make a judgment. But at the time that that judgment happens, there is nothing you can do about the, the actions. It will be viewed only through the lens of the past. The question is, who is this observer? Anyone? It's an old Buddhist cone. So that gives you a hint. Who is the observer? It's you. You are observe, will observe yourself through the lens of your memories and you will judge yourself. When you are old. Now, if you happen to be religious, you're going to get judged twice. So, you know, bonus. Uh, but the, the most important point here is you will be old and crotchety and judgmental, and you will be judging the actions of the person here and now doing these things. And nothing you can do will hide your actions from this observer. So be very careful when you consider what it is you're doing and why you do it, because at some point in the future, you're going to have to reckon with those decisions. And it's usually at this point, someone snarky uh, points out, well, I'm gonna die early. Let's just assume for the second, maybe you won't. And maybe you will have to deal with this. Now, this raises the, the, the question, how does one live a good life in this uh, existentially terrifying context. <laughs> um, and the answer is simpler than it sounds, at least for you. It is constant self-evaluation. Do this judgment every day on your actions. Make sure you consider this perspective when you make a decision in the first place. Because then when you get to the end and the sum total judgment of all the uh, accumulated uh, uh, actions that you take are judged by the ultimate observer, there shouldn't be anything to, to fear or worry about at that point. If you do this constantly and if you are self-reflective constantly, you can keep this perspective of uh, uh, I am, I understand my situation. I understand the consequences, potential and actual for my actions. And I understand how what I'm doing is trying to make the world a better place. Now, everybody fails and no one should feel judgment on themselves for failing. I have <laughs> 10 years of failed businesses and oh, so many debts, uh, uh, you know. But I don't feel guilt because I tried my best to do the right thing. And I understood what I was doing at the time as trying to do the right thing. Now, 
I point this out particularly among engineering students because engineering students have a common thread problem of I just do engineering. I'm just engineering a thing. I'm just making my thing because that's what I'm interested in. I'm an engineer. That doesn't cut it. <laughs> or rather, that won't cut it for long. Eventually, you know, you go home. Eventually, you establish a healthy work-life balance where the majority of your life is not the work you do. And in that spare time, you will reflect. What am I doing? Why am I doing it? These are important reflections and you should start that process early because thinking about how you're going to make the world a better place gives you perspective on immediate decisions right now. What internship do you get? What classes do you check? What uh, certifications are you looking for? All of this boils down to these choices are your ideology, the framework in your mind that decides what is good and bad that framework will is the mechanism that creates all the actions that you take in your life. If you work hard early to establish an ideology that you understand and understand it, not just in the surface, I know I, I think this, but you know why you think it, where those thoughts come from and how it forms a coherent ideology, that coherence is what saves you from the suffering down the line of judging oneself. If you have a coherent ideology, then you know that the rules you've established of moral good and bad are consistent with all the assumptions that you have in your head. And as long as your rules and assumptions are consistent, then whatever comes at you, you can trust yourself that the actions will uh, uh, be morally justified thereafter if you do the work. If you don't do the work, if you just casually, well, I'm set up perfectly to begin with. I've got religious background, so I don't have to, well, no, maybe you didn't get it all correctly. I mean, how many people have literally read every line of the Bible and every other religious text, you know, all together and compared notes to see which one makes the most sense? Look, this is a long and difficult process, and that's the point. There is a lot of sources of morality as Kantian ethics. There's the, uh, the entire uh, continental school of, of uh, um, sort of combative uh, philosophy. There's, you know, separate from all of those, all of the religious texts. These are all sources of moralities that humans have used to make judgments about what is good, what is bad, and how one should act throughout history gaining a knowledge of that historical context is really important. So now this brings us back to, all right, here is our, our understanding of right action. And so the core concern that so many of you had was about jobs. So we're gonna spend a good amount of time on that. Uh, now that we have sort of a framing of what is philosophy and how are we making decisions and what do we mean by morality? So, So what do we do about jobs? What do you do? You know, given that context, given the framing, what then must you do? <laughs> We've got an idea, who's got a plan? Who feels great and is sort of ready to get ripping? Hands? <laughs> One. Uh, it, anyone else? All right, let's hear Dionysus' plan and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll crank right into it. Work I jo job, I believe, is meaningful. No microphone today, I'm guessing? Yeah, all right. Um, yes, work a meaningful job is, is sort of a, a, uh, a good place to start. As a, as a concept, the question is, what does meaningful mean? And, you know, well, uh, that's subjective. Mean? That's subjective. Ah, okay. Oh, he does have a microphone. Oh, he's back. Okay, good. Right. right so so what, <clears throat> what I mean by that is I have my own presuppositions to what I find is meaningful. So I operate based on that. Now, I can sit down and reflect on these presuppositions and say, well, is that 
is that presupposition actually meaningful or is that ju- or am I just deluded? I mean, uh, th- that is sort of the core conundrum. One, And the point is, there's nothing I'm going to say that's going to solve this problem for you quickly. Like, I don't have the answer other than to say that the answer is constant self-reflection for exactly. a long exactly. period of time. <laughs> um, so, so what about John? What do we do? What is, uh, uh, all right, let, let's put this a different way. It's really easy to imagine a job apocalypse uh, of uh, the jobs going away via robots for uh, various reasons. Uh, I mean, we just established very cleanly and clearly the uh, distinction between essential employees and unessential employees uh, now, haven't we? Uh, Not to mention the fact that any job that can be done via the internet could theoretically be in some level automated. us in the education uh, field are concerned about recorded lectures and uh, automated testing. Um, maybe not w- as high up as WPI, but lower level education is definitely concerned about that. Public high schools, public uh, 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 colleges are very concerned about uh, employment being displaced by, by that. Um, so w- what does the world without jobs look like? Well, one of two things either utopia where everyone's needs are catered to as outlined in many in many older texts or dystopia where uh, which seems to be the more likely outcome but i don't want to be too negative <laughs> well not to be too terribly negative uh, uh sort of in, in general uh but dystopia is easier you know as as evidenced by the how do you build an evil uh, a bad robot I mean, I think pretty much everyone can think of a robot that's like bad because it's kind of easy, you know. Anything that makes a robot good just requires more effort and thinking and thought and and making something bad is easy because the whole definition of bad is not caring about the consequences of an action. Bad's easy, you know. Good is hard and and accidentally bad is even, it's just as easy as intentionally bad. So easier according to the second law of thermodynamics. So yeah, yeah, you just head towards chaos and and things are 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 easy. You know, uh, disassembly is easier than than assembly. Uh, rapid disassembly is even easier. Um, here, let's uh, let's hear from Ryan. What's what is a good? What's our 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 world without jobs look like? And how does it not suck? How do we make it not suck? Well, I was this kind of I was kind of going in a different direction. All this comes back to kind of a flaw with capitalism now, doesn't it? Because I mean, does it inherent flaw of capitalism that you kind of require the fact that, Oh, if there are no jobs there, like you have to have a sense of currency. And without that, you're kind of, it doesn't work. The system you need, I can't, I can't put it into words. (laughs) Okay. So not to, uh, um, now I, I'm usually the first one to, to criticize capitalism, but I got to play a devil's advocate because, you know, that's, that's how we play this game here. Uh, philosophy is about questioning. Uh, uh, so, okay. What, what do exactly do we mean by capitalism and, and what is the, the alternative in that context? So if, if you studied any Marxist theory, you'd, you'd understand that sort of on the other side, the idea of uh, sort of the anti-capitalist answer is that uh, uh, sort of intrinsic labor theory of value. The, the laborers create the value, therefore they uh, control the means of production, and so they are justly the owners of the means of production. Okay, that's an interesting thought, but again, that has the exact same problem that capitalism does. If you don't have laborers creating the value, then the basis for that society has no functioning path forward either. So what, the robots create all the value and where are the laborers in all this? There are no yes. laborers. Like the whole problem that we're running into here is the what amount of the necessary laborers? labor for producing everything that we as a society need is reducing rapidly. Uh, and I dare say has gone way past the point where we need everyone to produce stuff for, you know, 
because let's just take a look at necessities. Necessities are still running right now. That's what's being what who has a job is anything that's necessary. So everyone else wasn't necessary. They were just doing some sort of frivolous extra thing. And pay attention right now because this is, you know, what's happening now with coronavirus uh, uh, as, as a crisis is going to happen with automation as a rolling uh, uh, disruption. It's basically the same principle. Those who are unnecessary, instead of being forced out of the economy by sort of government fiat, uh, they're going to be pushed out of the economy by the efficiencies of automation and the inefficiencies of labor, which is only made worse by, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a massive pandemic in the first place. You know, there's, I can't tell you how many, like, tons and tons of grants are being thrown at automation, this, that, and the other thing uh, right now on, you know, there, there is money to be had if you want to make a robot that, like, takes one more person out of the economy all of a sudden. The, uh, you know, and it does raise the question, should people be in the economy? Is that even the right place for people? So I, as much as I would like to uh, take a big duty on capitalism all the time, that's not necessarily the problem, nor is that addressing that going to be the answer because the other side of not capitalism uh, uh, doesn't have an answer for structuring society with automation either. Uh, with the exception being there's a, a small section in the Grundrisse uh, called the Fragment on the Machines, which does sort of go into uh, uh, detail on, on that problem. But it basically says yes, and it blows up the entirety of the structure of society, and we don't really have a plan for how to go forwards. Um, does raise the interesting point of, uh, in that context, um, if it's not labor, what is the value in society? What is value? Hands. What is value? Madeline. I mean, value is what we as a society decided is. It's completely arbitrary in that, like, we've decided as a society that labor is valuable. And so we base our economy on labor. But we could decide that something else is what we want to decide. Like gold is valuable, not because it has any practical use for really anything except for electronics, which wasn't until recently. But we jewelry that before it's going to be valuable. So it's been valuable throughout the course of history. Well, when let's look at it like this: when a robot makes a part. To whom does the part belong? Let, let's just assume that that the raw material costs are are negligible, uh, um, and and so are the energy costs. Let, let's just focus on on the act of production here. Um, the Foise print cube prints out a plastic part. Philosophically, to whom does it belong and why? It's not an easy question to answer, is it? You could argue from multiple perspectives. You could argue it doesn't belong to anyone uh, because no one made it. You could argue that the person who made the robot, who made the part, owns it because they made the robot who made the part. You could oh, why does that? How does one's ownership philosophically transfer through a piece of the physical world that isn't actually your labor? So, you know, when we say that one, one owns something, it, it has, uh, we're referring to property. When, when, is, when does property come into existence? And if we're human beings and we need a certain amount of property to exist uh, uh, in, our, in our daily lives, how do we gain access to that property? If our labor is no longer the basis of society, how does one justify access to property? in a post-labor automated civilization. Hands, who wants to take that one? <laughs> Puts his hand down real quick. David. 
Well, if I remember correctly, according to Marx, uh, he put in his book that, well, at the time it was like, it, you don't only own the, the property made by your own labor, but also the labor of your slaves at the time or your workers. It, you can probably expand that as in the labor of what you created, what comes the labor out of that, then maybe it's your own property. Just be a little careful as not Marx uh, talking about uh, uh, his theories. He's talking about capitalism. In capitalism, you own your labor and the labor of slaves and the labor of uh, temporary slaves that we call employees. Um, Actually, wait. Uh, I'm sorry. I think I'm mistaken. Those are I capitalist principles described was... by Marx in, in Capital Volume 1. But um, yeah, that, that, be clear that that's the... Uh, um, capitalist structure that operates that way. So, <laughs> anyway, uh, point being, we, we want to look at, uh, okay, so if there's no labor associated with production of items, how do we, who aren't laboring, gain rights to the produced thing? How do you how do you justify access to something that is produced for which you didn't participate in its production? Because it's not like it's somebody else's labor. It's just the robot doing it. Hmm. Caden? Um, honestly, I'm not really sure how to answer that, but I guess like what I want to go with this is like, we, uh, we used to value ownership by like working towards something or like working to do something like saving up for a house. So in, in a sense, like if nothing is, uh, if our labor is like not like owned by us, then we won't own whatever is produced by that labor. Well, I'm not saying you don't own your labor. I'm just saying your labor does not have any value. Like you're not producing anything. The, you, when the robot prints a part, you're not doing something. So how do you, when, you know, that model of, okay, the 3D printer is doing it in the FOISE EQ and we can see that as a specific example, how do we broaden this out and understand a world like that? How do you, after labor is no longer valuable, justify access to that which is produced? I say it would cause a lot of conflict because if there's not enough supply of that part, then how do we say who own, like who gets first priority over what? All right, so so let's imagine the the entire production queue. So this this is some uh, uh, project that I've been working on uh, for a while, uh, specifying a machine, a very particular machine that is possible with current technology, but not likely uh, to exist for you know. Uh, unless some significant open source development is done. So on one side, we have an aquaponics farm. We have fish, we have plants, they pull CO2 out of the atmosphere, they use sunlight for, for their raw energy source, and they produce materials. Some of that material is in the form of food, some of it is raw materials into pr the production system. In the middle, we have industrial material synthesis. Um, uh, cracking your uh, starch molecules down into epoxies of various sorts and uh, uh, anything you could think of as a petrochemical you can source from sugar. Uh, it's basically the same idea. Um, you know, PLA plastics, wood fibers for uh, uh, clothing and, and basically all of medical supplies. Um, the, uh, the general idea is that you can get to the point where you can produce all of these things at zero marginal cost. And if all of the designs are open source, you have this machine that one machine can make two, two can make four, four can make eight, and the, the machine can self reproduce. And this is sort of current technology uh, if you were at it. So the, qu the question becomes, if the machine can make all the things and the cost of production is literally air and the sunlight that falls in it, so there's actually no physical limit on production, and the machine can make copies of itself, so uh, throughput bottlenecks can be solved internally by the system. How do you describe a world where everyone has access to what the machine produces and why? What is their justification? 
you know, and this is where the, the challenge to jobs comes in. And this is why I wanted to make this point. Everyone's talking about jobs, but you really can't pretend like that's going to be the answer. There's not going to be another job and jobs are not like the source of the solution. They're, they're kind of a description of a problem instead. So think, and I challenge you to think in terms of assumptions that you all seem to have brought into this, the assumption that jobs are a necessary organizing principle of society and that automation is in any way a threat to the existence of a, uh, a positive and technological future for, for all of humanity. So over by a minute, uh, uh, I uh, uh, certain I don't know that I can stay on. Can I stay on for anyone that wants to keep talking or do you need the channel back? Um, so, uh, no, I can make you the host. Uh, the, uh, I normally have my office hours at, at one, but you can stay on because we actually have a project. I would encourage people to register for Project Presentation Day and watch, watch some of the MQPs uh, presentations. There's some really neat MQPs and robotics that are going to be there, uh, both today and tomorrow morning, so this afternoon and tomorrow morning. But um, anyway, so I'll make you the host, and I have to leave the meeting. But uh, okay. thanks, for, thanks, for, thanks for your time, Kevin. Appreciate your uh, thoughts. All right. So I'm going to stick around, and if anyone wants to uh, keep chit-chatting on this topic, I, um, this, this is what so I do. So you're the host now. Woo! All right, so Kevin, going back to your point,